shit. And I'm sitting here driving, doing all the driving, man, whole fucking way from Brainerd, driving, just trying to chat, you know, keep our spirits up, fight the boredom of the road. And you can't say one fucking thing just in the way of conversation. Oh, fuck it. I don't have to talk either, man. See how you like it. Just total fucking silence. Two could play at that game, smart guy. We'll just see how you like it. Total silence. As I'm getting old, the chip up on my shoulder, blow through life. Hey guys, it's Street, and today I'm going to be reviewing the 1990s comedy crime thriller, Fargo. Fargo was directed by the Coen brothers. This film starred Francis McDormand, William H. Macy, and Steve Buscemi. The film is about Jerry Lundegaard, who's experiencing some financial turmoil. To solve this, he manages to contact two criminals to do his bidding. The funny looking guy Carl Showalter, and the silent but menacing Gear Grimsrud. Jerry instructs them to kidnap his wife Jean for ransom, knowing her father is quite affluent. After this, he wants them to split the money so he can pay off his impending dues. The plan seems straightforward enough until everything goes erroneous, resulting in the gruesome death of multiple people. Meanwhile, the delightful police officer Marge Gunderson is called in to investigate this case, as Jerry's plan slowly decays into a chaotic cacophony of comic violence. Welcome to the second entry in Fan Appreciation Month, and this film was suggested by a longtime fan of mine, like not super long, but he's been around since uh, sometime maybe in 2021 or early 2022 or something like that. This film was recommended to me by Francis Chainsaw Grimm. I've seen him around in my comments, and he described this film as his favorite film of all time. And I've heard murmurs of this film for a long, long time. This is one of those films that I heard about even before The Big Lebowski, which was directed, also directed by the Coen brothers. And a lot of people describe this film as like a life-changing, gripping, and compelling masterpiece. And I just, I didn't know anything other than that. Now, at first glance, when I looked at a few, like, uh, photos of the cinematography... And uh, when I observed the poster, I assumed the film would be more like a quiet, reflective, atmospheric drama, something along the lines of uh, The Fox, which is a gorgeously, criminally underrated film that I recommend that anyone watch. It's a, such a touching film that explores the uh, complexity of a lesbian relationship, and it does it in a way that's not pandering, uh, nor exploitive. It, it's, it handles it in a very mature manner, and it's honestly a really touching and haunting film that leaves you with um, with resonance. Like, it, it really resonates with you. And it was actually a pretty brave film to make for that time. Like, unlike now, where you make a, a gay film full of stereotypes and people clap like seals. But anyways, besides that, this isn't a review of The Fox. Just watch The Fox, too. This is a review of Fargo. Now, it wasn't exactly what I expected, but I still absolutely loved it in every way. I'm going to spoil my review here. I don't have any negatives, okay? So don't expect weaknesses, because this film has none. I absolutely loved it. It works as both a comedy and a crime thriller. Now, on the comedy aspect, the comedy is very dry, it's very realistic. It's nothing too wacky, you know. It's not like a, an early 2000s comedy or even like a late 90s comedy. It The comedy here, it's, it's so subtle. It's so realistic. A lot of the comedy relies on how people talk. Uh, they sometimes repeat things or they make like a subtle face or a gesture or something like that. And you may think from the way I'm describing it that, oh, that's boring. 
But no, it's actually it's actually really funny. This is a film where the comedy just works so well that you can't really describe it. You have to watch it for yourself to really understand what I'm talking about. And as for a crime thriller, it's a very unique crime thriller. You see, with the like the film, it's just it's amazing how it contra how the film looks. The film, the, the way it looks, I don't. I'm trying to describe this. The way the film looks contrasts to the actual substance of the film. The substance of the film is very, you know, comedic and such. There's some uh, emotional undertones too, but it's a very comedic film that you don't really take anything seriously. Yet it's shot in such like a bleak manner, and I'll get into that. And there's also lots of nice little nods to Kubrick. Um, in the movie, my favorite character, um, Carl Showalter, he talks about, he, he goes into a bar and he's like, I'd like an in-out, in-out or something, and that was a reference to the Clockwork Orange, there's a few shots in here that are references to The Shining, uh, there's, I think there's another reference to, um, uh, Full Metal Jacket, unfortunately I've not finished that yet, every time I try to watch Full Metal Jacket, I always watch the first half. And then I just stopped there, you know? Right after, um, Pyle, at Re Gomer Pyle, uh, he's nicknamed that, the, the fat guy. After he kills himself, that's when I kind of dip out of the movie. I'll finish it eventually, but anyways. Now for the strengths. The characters are amazing. On, there's no character in this film that's boring. Every single character in this film is just hilarious in their own way. Even some of the background characters are, like, humorous. And I love a film that does that, where even uh, insignificant little one-off back, uh, background characters, they have their own little charms to them, you know? And Dumb and Dumber does something similar to that, where, um, where it shows the police officer and he stops him, and he drinks the, 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 the beer with, with piss in it, you know? I just, I love movies that do that, you know? But anyways, let's get to the individual characters. We've got Marge, who's played by Frances McDormand, and, oh god, she should have won a fucking Oscar for this. She was so wholesome. I absolutely loved her portrayal as Marge. She was just such a lovely, lovely person. I think... The role of the jaded cop has been a little, um, what's the word, overused. So it's really refreshing to see a cop that's not all Debbie Downery, that's not all uh, ornery and, and thinking, oh, the world's full of crime, I hate everyone, I hate the world. But no, she's going through this, she's seeing these grim and grisly cases, and she's all like, well... I will tell you the way to find one, find out, don't you know, or something like that, you know, she's got a little Minnesota accent, and she's just so cheerful, and it's, and it's infectious, I, even talking about it, or thinking about it, she's just such a sweetheart, and I love her, uh, relationship with her husband, Norm, there's, it's, it's said there's such a calm sweetness to their relationship, you know, they're not overly lovey-dovey or anything. They're sort of casual with each other. But you can feel the love there, and it really warms my heart. And on the opposite, and also, even though she is cheery and delightful, she's not stupid. She's actually very smart, and she is she follows this case cast iron. She does a very good job at trying to solve everything. And I like how they managed to make her cheery yet intelligent. Because in your typical Hollywood movie, if she was all cheery, they just they just make her like stupid. But I'm glad that they gave her some intelligence, despite her being you know cheery. And another my favorite character in the film is Carl Carl Showalter, played masterfully by Steve Buscemi. He's he's such a little conniving prick. You can tell that he's not really down with kind of murdering shit, but he, he has no quandary against stealing and robbing and such like that, committing crimes. 
even though he does kill someone uh, later in the film, uh, he, he, I think he only did that out of protection. Most of the killing is done by Gear, and I'll talk to him in a minute. I'll talk about him in a minute. But yeah, Carl, he's just such a... He's such an asshole. He's, he's a likable asshole. And I looked up some trivia about this film. And apparently the Cohen brothers, they, they specifically wrote Carl for Steve Buscemi. And that's just incredible. I feel like they, I, I think they saw Reservoir Dogs and thought, you know what? We need this guy in our movie, you know? And that's what I'm thinking. He, he just does a fantastic job. And Gear, oh gosh. He is genuinely frightening. Uh, Gear Grimsrud. He's got he's got such a fairy tale name. He's I think he's Swedish or something. But he barely has any dialogue. He he does this. He, he's an amazing actor with his expressions. You can really tell what he's thinking. And he fucking hates Carl. He hates his guts. He hates hanging out with him. And there's a really funny scene where uh, Carl's just trying to have a conversation while on the road. And, um, Gear, he's just like, and, uh, Carl's like, you know, fine, you, you don't want to talk to me? Fine. We'll have a complete silence. Complete fucking silence. Complete silence. Look, I'm not talking. Complete silence. And he says this over and over, and he starts to really get on his nerves. It's, it's great. It's great. And, yeah, back, back to, uh, Gear, um, uh, he's, a. Uh, He's so he's de he's genuinely menacing, but they give him little character quirks that sort of make even him kind of silly looking. Because near the end of the film, he's like watching a soap opera so intently. Like in your regular comedy, he'd just be jumping and be like, "Oh, no, oh, no, Gertha, Gertha, don't, don't, don't open that door! It's Jeffrey. He cheated on you!" Or some stupid shit like that. But no, he's just watching. He's like. And he's just watching, you know? And he, 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 it, it, it's not overblown. Everything about this film is just so beautifully subtle. And I love that. And, oh God, Jerry. Jerry played by William H. Macy, who I recognize from Jurassic Park 3. And embarrassingly enough, I've got a few takes on that film. But anyways, he does a great job as Jerry. Jerry's just this completely ballless, pathetic little spineless coward of a man. When he gets arrested at, at the end of the film, he just sobs and cries like a pathetic bitch. He's like, no! 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 You know? It, he, William just does such a great job at playing him. He, it's great, man. And another thing I liked about this film was the dreamlike atmosphere. And like I mentioned before, the film, it's very silly, it's subtly silly, yet it's filmed in a way where everything looks so bleak and depressing and empty, and that's such an interesting contrast to put in your film. It's, I, I believe that might tie in with the message of the film, how warmness and warmth and goodness can be found anywhere. You know, even in such a cold, dreary, dismal place like this. And the whole film had, like, a dream-like quality to it. And I watched it uh, very late at night from, like, 1 to 3 a.m. with my best pal Jordan. And I forgot to mention that me and Jordan watched this together, and he also loved it. He gave it his um, rating that usually means, like, it's top-tier shit, saying that he would, it's DVD-worthy. And I definitely agree. I'd say it's fucking VHS worry. No, it's VHS worthy. Sorry, I'm a little tongue tied. When I get excited, my words just, you know, it's all over the place. <laughs> I actually think VHS is a lot better than DVD. They're they're more durable. But anyways, the cinematography is also really gorgeous. There's these wide shots where you see these snowy roads. You see some cars par parked in these snowy uh, car lots. And it just feels like you're looking at beautiful paintings. And it's just so gorgeous to look at. Like, this film is so aesthetically pleasing. The cinematography is, 
is just so idyllic. And like I said, the comedy is subtly funny. It's sort of like, it's quirky, but in a good way. You know what I mean? And as for the final strength, I love the music. I think the, mu the music's not overplayed. I think it complements the film's um, unique atmosphere very well. And of course, for the weaknesses, I have none, like I said in the beginning. And... When I first watched this film, no, when, when I, before I started watching this film, I was sort of concerned that it might fly over my head like the Big Lebowski, because that took me about three watches to truly understand what it was about. So I was concerned that this film would maybe fly over my head at first and kind of confuse me, but after watching it, I feel like I really took in the mantra that this film is trying to say. I feel like I really understood what the film was about. The film at its core is about the dangers of greed. It's about discontent. It's about sentimentality versus materialism. Because you've got Marge and her husband, Norm. They're not the most wealthiest people in the world, but they have an everlasting love together. They have a loyalty. They're happy with each other and where they're at. And in contrast, you have um, you have Jerry, who is very discontent with his life. All he cares about is money. He's so greedy, and the greed consumes him to the point that he loses everything. He loses his wife. Of uh, people who weren't even involved get killed. Uh, he ends he ends up getting her father killed via Carl. Uh, he ends up going to jail, and now his son has no one to turn to. Because the grandmother, um, the wife's mom, is, is presumably dead. So basically his greed destroyed his whole life. And this even applies to the villains, Carl and Gear. Because at the end, Car uh, Carl ends up getting the money after killing um, Jean, J the wife, Jean's father. And he buries it somewhere. He gets shot in the neck. And that, that's another thing I should mention. The effects are fucking great. I was worried there, there would be some CG blood. But luckily there's none. The blood looks really authentic and realistic. It's grueling to see Carl sort of gripping on his face. And he, he can't really understand much of what he's saying. Because he's got so much fucking blood pouring out. And it's, oh, fuck. It's hardcore, man. But anyways. He ends up getting that money, and he hides it, and he's got a shit ton of money, but he, he, he goes back to the cabin with Gear, and uh, Gene's dead, but um, Gear, he wants to split the car, you know, and uh, rather than, Carl, Carl gets fucking pissed, and rather than give him a few extra, you know, money for him to get a car, like split the car, he ends up telling him to go fuck himself, and Carl's had him. I mean, no, Gears had enough. And I knew, I fucking knew, as soon as he just fucking looked at him like that, oh, I knew he was dead. And I love the little added detail that he put on his app before he got the axe and fucking, oh, fucking killed his ass. And then later he, he puts him in the, um, he puts him in the wood chipper. But yeah, like I said, the film is basically about how greed can destroy one's life. And the last thing I want to talk about is perhaps my favorite scene when Marge is sort of letting out her stream of consciousness after arresting Gear. You know, she just doesn't understand how money could possess someone to commit all of these atrocities, you know, for a few little dollars. And that really shows how innocent she is. And it really shows that she hasn't let this grueling job affect her morals or her view on the world. You know, she's just generally doesn't understand how someone could be like this. Overall, I'm going to have to rate this a definite 10 out of 10. Thank you so much, Francis Chainsaw Grimp, for recommending me this film. It is indeed life-changing. 
It's one of the most unique and interesting and compelling films I have ever watched. And for those who haven't seen it, you are doing yourself a disservice by not seeing it. Well, guys, that was the review, and I will see you all next time. Thank you.